Welcome to the Action Network podcast presented by BetMGM. I'm your host, Maria Marino, and this is your Oscars Best Bets episode because we've got the 96th presentation of the Academy Awards this Sunday night at the Dolby Theater in Los Angeles. My guests today are two Oscars betting experts here at Action Network, Colin Whitchurch and Matt Remke, and together they will have eight total best bets for us. Plus, if you're looking for an even deeper dive into all the action, check out our Academy Awards betting preview with Chris Raybon and Colin Wilson, which dropped earlier this week right here on the Action Network podcast. Colin and Matt, how are we? Ready to try to win some money on the Oscars. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's going to be a good night. I'm excited to see my boy RDJ get up there one more time. But uh, let's let's make some picks and win some money before we get there. Sounds good. Well, let's not waste any time and we're going to get right into your picks. So, Colin, why don't you start us off? Sure. First of all, I just want to I think it's important to mention here that betting on the Oscars is kind of like unlike betting on anything else. This is not like betting on sports. There's no second place. It's tougher to justify a losing bet as having value. Um, like in golf, for example, you can say I bet Sepp Straka at 100 to 1, and he lost by one stroke. So I can kind of rationalize my loss and justify my loss. There's no second place here. There's the winner, and then there's everybody else. I mean, there's technically a second place, but we don't know the second place. Also, it's important mm -hmm. to note, we're literally betting on something in which the results have already been decided. There's nothing else like that in sports betting. Balloting for the Oscars ended on February 27th. The ballots have been tabulated by PricewaterhouseCooper already. Two, three random people maybe know the answers. <laughs> We're betting on these, trying to guess what these voters are doing when it's already been decided. There's nothing else like that. Just wanted to preface that before I jump into my first pick. Probably my favorite pick is in the best original screenplay category. Both of these screenplay categories, and I know we're going to talk about both, are very interesting this year because unlike past years, the Writers Guild has not given out its awards yet. The WGA strike postponed the award show until April, so we don't know who the WGA likes this year, and usually that's a very strong correlation to these awards. So... With categories like this, and you're, you're going to hear me talk about this a lot in this episode, I'm not necessarily looking for undervalued long shots, but more overvalued favorites. Categories where the favorites are modeled at less than 50% chance to win. Categories with more randomness, uh, if you will. Now, Ben Zausmer at The Hollywood Reporter has been modeling uh, the Oscars for quite a while. I lean heavily on his model. Anatomy of a Fall is the favorite in this category, but he gives it just a 42.8% chance of winning. He actually gives Past Lives a 23% chance of winning, and Past Lives is way down the odds board. You can find it longer than 10 to 1 in a lot of places, so I'm definitely going to be taking a stab at that, as well as The Holdovers, which is the second favorite behind Anatomy of a Fall. He gives a 17.7% chance of winning. So again, the favorite has less than 50% chance of winning, more chance for randomness, so I like Past Lives and The Holdovers both in this category. I'm going to be taking a stab at both of them. Yes, very interesting. So... Odds of about minus 200 for Anatomy of a Fall. The holdovers at plus money, 150 or so. Past Lives up at plus 1,200 or so. All right. Yeah. Uh, with my first pick, another thing that makes the Oscars very different from sports betting is that narratives do matter a little bit more. Colin's going to throw a lot of numbers today. I'm not really a numbers Guy, I'm going to follow the narrative a little bit more here. Um, but also, like you said, overvalued favorites are kind of what I'm looking for when I'm going down this list. So my first pick is going to be in the best actress category, and it's going to be Emma Stone for Poor Things at plus 125. Now, Lily Gladstone and Killers of the Flower Moon, minus 175. I think if she won, nobody would you know raise any concern about that. She was wonderful in that movie. Um, but my thought process on it is at minus 175 there's not a ton of value there if it was closer to the plus money number i think we'd be all over it but i think if you're going to take a stab at any acting category i think emma stone's where you want to go lily gladstone was great in that movie but she was really asked to do one thing and that was be incredibly sad anytime any of her seven family members died but um emma stone i think in poor things was uh, able to show the absolute versatility of her talent in the best actress category in one of the most wild all over the place movies being the catalyst for poor things. And also at the end of the day, 
Um, as much as we might not like to hear it, the Oscars, the Academy, they do have their people and they like their people. And no one's more of a theater kid. No one's more of an Oscars darling than Emma Stone. So I think while Lily Gladstone is more than deserving of this win, no one's going to be surprised if Stone's name gets called here at plus 125. I'm willing to take a move there. I find this one very interesting because it's one of the like major awards talking like actor, actress, um, director, best picture that it, it feels like there's a chance mm -hmm. that the favorite <laughs> won't win. Um, and I saw this from BetMGM as well, that uh, highest bet percentage is on Lily Gladstone at over 70% and highest handle percentage is also on Lily Gladstone at over 75%. But I think there is this is one of those major categories that there might be at least a slight dilemma uh, with the voters. Yeah. And, and Lily Gladstone's winning all the prelim awards heading into the Oscars here, which I think is a reason you're seeing a lot of those numbers pop up. But I'm just taking a shot on, you know, ev everyone loves Emma Stone, especially the Academy. And I yep. weirdly enough, we saw it with Jamie Lee Curtis last year. That matters. They do. They do look into who people love a lot in these situations. I'm also glad that you brought up just the idea of narratives and also history, um, particularly recent history throughout the Oscars and um, some big names that are attached to movies and uh, whether they've been snubbed in the past and uh, whether they've won in the past. But with that being said, Colin, um, one of the movies that definitely has a narrative attached to it is Barbie. Yeah, Barbie, obviously, uh the highest grossing film of 2023 ton of buzz very beautiful fun film i i i actually did the barbie oppenheimer uh double header when they came out and i watched Same. them both back to back it was, it was a ton of fun um but yeah barbie i don't know what barbie's gonna win necessarily on sunday but one category i'm targeting it in is best adapted screenplay i can be quick here Went on my screenplay diatribe uh, with the original screenplay category, and the same thing applies here. American Fiction's the favorite in this category. Ben Zausmer only gives it a 40.8% chance of winning. Barbie's up there at 23.6%, and I think Barbie's actually has the third lowest odds of all the nominees. And four of the five nominees have better than 10% chance of winning. You got Barbie at 23.6%, Oppenheimer at 17%, Poor Things at 13.6%. The interesting thing in this category, though, is that Barbie is in the adapted screenplay category. Most of the other award circuits leading up to it, it was deemed an original screenplay, but the Academy decided it was adapted. So it's mm. going up against films here that it didn't go up against in the BAFTAs, the, the Screen Actors Guild, etc. All the other uh, screenwriting award shows. Um, so there's a high level of variance in this category this year, even more so than the original screenplay category. Um, so I'm seeing Barbie around the plus 500 range right now. I love that. Um, definitely willing to take a shot on it. Again, very much a beloved public movie. Uh, I don't know how many awards it's actually going to get on Sunday, but Adapted Screenplay is one where it definitely has a shot, especially at plus money. Yeah, and Matt, it feels like Barbie is deserving of some recognition, right? But in so many of the other categories, it might be hard to justify. You also like this pick for adapted screenplay. Yeah, and just to follow up on what Colin uh, said there, it's it's less so about, you know, do we think that Barbie is, you know, going to take this award based on, you know, is it better than the other screenplays? At plus 500, I think it's worth a shot here because of what you just said, Maria. I don't think Barbie's going to win anything else. And, you know, when the nominations come out for the Academy Awards, you know, some of the conversation is about which movie got the most awards that that can happen. But more often than not, it's about the snubs. It's about who didn't get nominated for certain things. Margot Robbie, Greta Gerwig, Barbie overall snub across the board. People were very upset about it. I'm on Blockbuster Twitter. People are not happy <laughs> about that at all. And um, I think if they're going to give Barbie anything, it's going to be this and tinfoil hat Oscar scripted. Maybe that's the reason they moved it to adapted screenplay to give it a better shot at getting an award and getting, I don't know if it's going to be Greta hopping up there, but if they can get Greta Gerwig on stage, people are going to be very happy about it. So it's a good way to smooth things over, I think, for the audience. But also at plus 500, like Colin laid out, a lot of the picks in this category have a shot. 
Um, I don't think anybody's going to be surprised at Oppenheimer or anything else, you know, that's not the favorite getting a win here, but at plus 500, if you're going to bet on Barbie to win anything, this is the category. And I think this is where you go. Right. And just like, I think folks want to give Barbie some recognition. They also may have, I don't know if fatigue is the right word, but we know Oppenheimer is probably going to get a lot of love in a lot of other categories. So even though they're at plus 200 or so, and American fiction at uh, minus money and being the favorite, um, this could be the spot. So let's move on, Colin. What's your next pick? Yeah, we've been talking a lot about kind of math versus narrative today. Um, Matt says he's more of a narrative guy. I'm more of a, a numbers guy here. But I'm going to go with more of a narrative angle here for my pick for best animated feature and that is The Boy and the Heron. It has the second lowest odds right now. You see it around plus 125. Now, this is, again, straying from my uh, pattern of looking for favorites that are below 50%. Ben Zausmer gives Spider-Man uh, across the Spider-Verse into the Spider-Verse. I don't, I don't remember. The Spider-verse. <laughs> across the Spider-Verse. There it is. Uh, a 74.1% chance of winning this award, and The Boy and the Heron is at 18.1%. But again, going with a little bit of the narrative angle here, Heo Miyazaki is considered an animation legend, and this is reportedly the last film for the 83-year-old. Now, animated feature is a category that's only been around since 2001. It doesn't have the lengthy history of a lot of these other categories. Miyazaki's only won one Oscar. It was for Spirited Away. It was in 2002, the second year of this category, and he deserves more than one, and many in the Academy adore him and want to give him kind of a career achievement award before he goes out. It's also important to note that with the exception of Toy Story, the Academy has been very hesitant to give this award to sequels. The first animated Spider-Man won this award in 2018, but other sequels like Shrek, The Incredibles, How to Train Your Dragon, Kung Fu Panda were not as successful when they were nominated. In the case of Shrek and The Incredibles, the first movie actually won Best Animated Feature. The second movie did not. I think we see a good chance of that happening again here. I think The Boy and the Heron is... Uh, beloved by by voting members here in the academy i think that there might be a little bit of spider-man and comic book movie fatigue a little mm -hmm. bit as we've been seeing and i i know matt might uh might have some opinions on that uh but yeah the boy and the heron at plus money i think there's definitely value there given uh the narrative angle and the the sequel angle there with spider-man I love that look, not only because of the great analysis, but just because that might be a category that people aren't thinking of right away. And it's um, just a good one to keep in mind. All right, Matt, what's your next pick? Well, before I get to my next pick, I do I just have one quick point on the animated feature here. I wasn't, there. I didn't feel comfortable putting um, Across the Spider-Verse to win animated uh, feature as one of my picks. Don't love the number that we're getting. Uh, you know, Boy in the Heron, it's a goat director situation and I haven't seen it. So I, I didn't feel comfortable battling against it. But on the superhero fatigue thing, if I can get on my pedestal right quick, oh, um, it's I promise you more than anything, it's bad superhero movie fatigue. It's bad superhero movies, of which there are plenty from this exact studio that is driving people down. But Across the Spider-Verse is not only one of the best comic book movies I've ever seen, it's one of the best comic book sequels I've ever seen and the most beautiful animated movie I've ever watched in my entire life. So I am in full support of this movie winning. I don't think we're getting a great number um, because it's such a heavy favorite, 71%, as Colin said. But I just needed to get out there and say that Across the Spider-Verse, I think, is a lock here, but, you know, it's it might not be worth the change uh, getting out here. I really appreciate you making that distinction that, you know, not all superhero movies are good or bad. And there are some, you know, great films included within that sort of genre, even though from the outside, some may see it as overplayed. But that being said, you want to move on to your next pick now? Absolutely. And ironically, I am going to pick a favorite here for my last pick. Um, and this is one of those where I had the thought like, you know, this would be a great pick if the number was right. And then I looked at the number and man alive, is this way shorter than I thought it was going to be. Um, it's going to be best sound Oppenheimer at minus 250. Obviously, you know, you got to put a lot in to get a lot back here. But I cannot believe this is not a bigger difference um, between this and uh, the second favor here at 250. I'm willing to put the majority of my night on Oppenheimer for best sound. And it's a two prong kind of thing. 
I think that last year, everything, everywhere, all at once dominated the Oscars in best picture, best director, and then a handful of actor and production categories. I think mm-hmm. next year we're going to see best picture, best director, best actors across the board and production be dominated by Dune 2. If you haven't seen it, go see it. Um, and I think I'm betting on three in a row here because I do think Oppenheimer is going to dominate the night. And these are the type of awards that are going to stack up the numbers for Oppenheimer um, at the end, along with the best director, best picture and all the actor awards that we expect it to get. Um, but the other thing here is best sound. This movie is great for a lot of different reasons, but I do think that the sound specifically is one of the keystone features of why this movie was so successful, not only in the box office, but also just the experience of watching it. The sound in Oppenheimer really drives a lot of the immersion that this movie has. And I think that, you know, that being not just a great part of the movie, but the driving force of the movie, along with all the other things that it's going to get awards for. I, I needed to have Oppenheimer on my card. So I'm going to get Oppenheimer at best sound minus 250. Well, we've heard so much about Christopher Nolan and his preference for, you know, natural sound and things kind of sounding like real life. And so makes a whole lot of sense to me. Now we have a couple more picks from Colin, but I'm just giving you guys a heads up. I would like to end on a fun note. And so Matt, you can think about this while, you know, Colin is giving a couple more picks, but just your overall favorite film top to bottom that you watched all year. So keep that in mind. But first, Colin, you do have a couple more picks. That'll be easy for me. I will get into some picks. I do want to uh, mention real quick for best sound. I agree with Matt that Oppenheimer is going to win. It's a travesty that it's going to win. The zone of interest is the best mixed film I've ever seen from a sound perspective. Uh, anyway, people don't really care good. that much about <laughs> it's our, really good. People don't care that much about our personal opinions here. They want they want bets and they want winners. <laughs> My next pick. Still, I'm sorry, it's still um, important reference. So yes, I'm glad. <laughs> Uh, my next picks are correlated picks and they are for best production design and best costume design. Both cases, I am going with four things here. They're correlated this year because the same five films are nominated in both categories. It seems unlikely this year in particular for a film to win one and not the other. I know they're different kind of specialties and they're different, uh, guilds that, that run production versus costume design, but this is just a year where, where everything seems kind of split down the middle when it comes to these two categories. It's like, we just talked about best sound, best sound used to be split into two different categories. um, And now they're combined into one this year, production design and costume design kind of have that correlated play like sound used to. Um, So that's important to note, especially as you're watching the show, whichever of these categories they present first, whether it's production design or costume design, I don't know if they're going to have, live betting available on the Academy Awards. But if there are, if mm-hmm. Four Things wins best production design and costume design hasn't been presented yet, maybe go jump on it for costume design. Now, both of these films, uh, Barbie is favored, um, but below 50% in Ben Zausner's model. Actually, I think uh, Four Things moved to the favorite just in the last 24 hours in production design. But Barbie's its top uh, top contender up there along with it. Barbie's given a 40.2% chance in production design and a 48.3% chance in costume design. So again, this fits uh, a situation where randomness is definitely possible. Um, Production design seems a little bit more wide open. Oppenheimer and Killers of the Flower Moon are both above 10%. But in costume design, no other film tracks above 10% other than Barbie and Four Things. Um, There's a strong possibility that Four Things is this year's lots of nominations, very few wins film, especially if Emma Stone loses Best Actress, which I think she will necessarily. Um, I, I That's not one of my best bets, but I do think Lily Gladstone walks away with that award. And if that's the case, there's not a lot of opportunities for Poor Things to win here. So this would be the chance for the Academy to award this film uh, and not have it go home empty handed. I think that uh, when you look at it right now, Poor Things is slightly minus money in production design and it's slightly plus money in costume design. But again, I think if you're betting on one, you're betting on both, whether you like Barbie or poor things, 
you're going to get one at plus money, one at minus money. They'll kind of even things out. In my opinion, this one goes to poor things. If there's anything that you remember about that movie, it's the uniqueness of the the production design, costume design. This is a category where it can dominate, and this is the categories. These are the categories where I think the Academy is going to award that film. Fair enough. Any uh, any reaction, Matt? Before we get Colin's final pick. No, I think that you know I I was talking to Colin yesterday a lot like Barbie. I love when a movie commits to a thing and just dives all into a vision and has no hesitation going as weird and wacky as it can be. And Poor Things is that, just the same way Barbie is. And I think that that commitment came out in a really beautiful way, um, especially in the production and costume design across the board. Like that movie from front to back is just nothing but stunning visuals. And it's usually the things put in place, not even the post-production aspects of it. And Colin, uh, you like Poor Things as well, potentially, for your last pick. Yeah, one more shot at Poor Things. I said I, I don't know how many awards it's going to get, uh, but this is one more uh, category where I'm going to take a shot on it. Maestro has been a strong favorite in makeup and hairstyling pretty much since nominations came out. Um, but there's no strong indications that it's a shoe in for this award. Um, this is actually the only category in Ben Zausmer's model where he doesn't give a single film more than a 40% chance of winning. Uh, his model's top choice is actually Poor Things, which you can get around plus 110 right now. Uh, Maestro's at 33.4%. And Oppenheimer, which is still around 20 to 1 at some places, is actually not that far behind at 15.2%. So this is, again, another category where I'm very comfortable taking a swing at a couple of long shots. Poor things, not necessarily as much of a long shot at plus 110-ish. But then Oppenheimer, again, we've talked about it. It's going to clean up most of the night. This might be another technical category where the Academy just piles on to the accolades it's giving that film. At 20 to 1, it's worth a sprinkle, absolutely. But I'll have much more substantial money on poor things. I think Maestro is incredibly vulnerable uh, in this category. And so it's, it's ripe for the taking for a plus money bet. All right, wrapping up here momentarily, but before we do, Matt Remke, best thing top to bottom you watched all year? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Oppenheimer was the best movie I watched last year, followed shortly by Across the Spider-Verse, but that's not, I don't think, what I'm going to answer here. It's favorite, right? And yeah, I'm the comic book guy, and I know that it's really fun and cool, and you look like the coolest kid in school leaning against your locker smoking a cigarette if you hate on superhero movies right now. I know that's the most awesome thing to do on Twitter, but Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is my favorite thing I watched last year. James Gunn is my favorite director. Guardians 1 is my favorite movie. I walked down the aisle at my wedding to come and get your love. That's how involved in this movie I am. I think that it was a masterpiece of a trilogy. Um, it was a great way to end an amazing run of three movies that will make you cry, laugh, get excited, dramatic, all the things. It's nominated for Best VFX. It's not going to win. But I think that the animation in that movie is unbelievably, you know, more more realistic as far as animal animation than anything we've seen. And I think that Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is one of the best comic book movies I've ever seen. And it's definitely my favorite thing I watched last year, without a doubt. Awesome. Colin? Yeah, so this is actually a pretty easy decision for me to make. I've been ranking uh, every movie I watch every year for a good long while i've been tracking them on letterbox for the last uh three or four years you can follow me there at co witch church the um best. there there are three movies that stood out to me this year that were bar none the three best movies of the year and actually two of them are best picture nominees which doesn't usually happen for me i'm usually somewhat of a contrarian when it comes to the oscars the three best movies that i saw this year are the zone of interest past lives and a non-nominee, All of Us Strangers, starring Andrew Scott and Paul Mescal. Very, very highly recommended. Um, Past Lives and Zone of Interest had such a high degree of difficulty with what they what with what they uh what they presented. If you read the synopsis of either film, uh you could see how these films could go south very easily. Past lives could be read as kind of your stereotypical rom com or maybe just rom uh not necessarily the com <laughs> and you know the past of or the zone of interest uh making a holocaust movie uh and making it unique and making it not uh kind of flippantly is is 
very difficult, and there's been so many movies made about the Holocaust over the years. Nothing that has been made about the Holocaust uh, has ever looked like this movie, has ever sounded like this movie, has ever been anything like this movie. So um, those are movies that are going to stick with me for a very long time, uh, and they stood out well beyond uh, anything else I saw in 2023. Well, thank you both for that perspective. I do want to remind our listeners that the great state of North Carolina is launching sports betting this Monday, March 11th. So if you're in the Tar Heel State, take advantage of the best sign-up offers across every sports book. A link to all those offers is in this episode description. So if you're in North Carolina, check out that link. And that's going to do it for us here on the Action Network podcast, our Oscars Best Bets episode. We are back this Friday with our weekly UFC betting preview featuring our MMA crew. But want to thank everyone again for listening. For Colin Whitchurch, Matt Remke, and our producer, Matt Mitchell, I'm Maria Marino. We hope you and your crew enjoy the 96th presentation of the Academy Awards, and we'll see you back here next time on the Action Network podcast presented by BetMGM. 